thought I was all ready to go. <laughs> There's always something. I was thinking a few minutes ago as I was getting ready to draw paint and as I was getting ready to do this broadcast, I think, whoops, we barely have sound. Oh, something doesn't sound right. Let's try this. How about now? How about now? Hmm. Facebook, you guys are going to have to let me know if you're getting adequate, adequate volume. All right, I was going to say, few minutes ago I was thinking as I was setting up perhaps the biggest surprise to me if you had if you had um, introduced me to my 40 years ago if you had shown me what it was like being a full-time artist 40 years later I think one of the big shocks for me would have been how many preparation steps, how many preparatory steps there are to virtually every project I work on. For instance, I picked up another um, portrait job, coronavirus portrait special nice one close up of, of this young lady whose name is Nancy and uh, well looky there it's laminated there's both sides are important the fact that it's laminated is important that's the right ratio so I've already spent you know 30 minutes 25 minutes in Photoshop getting that ready pretty standard getting a canvas ready pretty standard and now I'm doing um, Some water, two two watercolor renderings, and um, whoops, and we have some noise. Bear with me. Let's get rid of the noise here in just a second. That didn't do it. Try this. All right, that did it. All right, so I spent at least an hour yesterday. Uh, doing this rough sketch. So this is a commercial job. The other rough sketch, I'm not sure if I still have it, might be around here somewhere. Well, here's, here's what my client's rendering looks like. That's actually a different job, but that's typical. Anyway, and uh, I sent this to my client last night. Then he we talked on the phone today, and after talking to him I made a number of changes spent another hour on Photoshop and by the way one one of you asked for a a little quick down and dirty Photoshop primer primer lesson I think that's a great idea I will do that not on not for this um, not for these jobs though but for the for the portrait jobs which I think will be a little bit more translatable um, again, just this, just the, the stages or the steps of, uh, and I'm going to move you guys in just a minute so you're looking down. And then I did a whole bunch of internet research where I printed off all the different plants. Not every one of these plants is going to be used for th this job, but 
couple of these pages are and laminated them more preparation more anyway just <laughs> i'm glad i didn't know <laughs> it probably would have scared the pants off me so to speak anyway i'm done with that that goes in the trash i keep my nice sketches that i'm very happy with but that's not one that's not pretty enough so um i'm doing in this broadcast and we'll see i might i might chop it up a little bit because it might get too tedious i'm doing two commercial jobs if you will illustrations architectural renderings and then one um a little more fine art illustration in other words the the commercial jobs are going to be used by my client to sell his services he's a landscape arch architect this job on the other hand is is a woman um surprising her husband this is her husband's place of work and she wants a nice artsy watercolor sketch rendering so anyway those are the three jobs i'm working on now let me go ahead and move you guys with my newly invented um let's let's hope it stays where it's supposed to stay all right, so far it's not doing very well because I want it to go like that and it's not happy doing that. So I did not foresee this this happening. Let's let's see if I can fix this in some way real quickly. Bear with me just a minute. I know you're getting a lot of shaking. Hang on. All right. Let's let's see if Let's see if that will work by any chance. You're looking pretty close down here at my work surface, aren't you? All right. So let's start drawing and talking. Now, again, what I'm, what you're looking at here is my sketch. I didn't show you this one a minute ago that I emailed to my client yesterday and then by the way gonna, now that I see a mirror image of it, I'm going to change it a little bit um, and he got back to me and made changes and I printed this off so this is a print off my this is the back side do you understand of, of uh, the image that I drew and I have control here of all my lights so I can get it the right setting the right exposure the pens i'm going to be using uh, for this job are two uh, fountain pens made by the, the cleverly named <laughs> i'm sarcastic pen and ink sketch that's the name of the, the brand i got to get these at jerry's and they're not expensive i have uh over the years bought a fair number of expensive fountain pens and some of them work fabulously some of them less than fabulously and many of them I destroy <laughs> in the course of using I mean they, they I don't mean I destroy them on purpose they just they just uh, wear out because I use them hard or hardly use them. no no I don't hardly use them I use them hardly all right so can we can you see what I'm doing I believe you can let me get some hello David Mercer YouTube is better again yeah and Tommy El Nazi that's an interesting name and Monique from Netherlands welcome probably all three illustrations that I'm doing this afternoon again two of them are quite commercial and one of them is um, more or less fine art artsy uh, but in all three cases I'm probably going to use a no ruler technique
The other pen that I'm using is one of these felt tip pens by Accurate, A-C-U-R-I-T. You probably can't read that. Sorry, it's too, the lighting is too bad here. I'm going to use that for my, my fine lines and cross hatching. And it's, it, is a <clears throat> it is a waterproof pen. The ink in this fountain pen is plain old fashioned um, ultra draw technical drawing proof ink, waterproof drawing ink, I mean. Um, you may not. Thank you. No. Sorry. Um, so all of the ink that I'm using for this job is waterproof. That's pretty important because I'm going to be going to be doing um, watercolor, of course, on top of this. Once again, um, you might be seeing that my, uh, there we go, I have Facebook up now. Hello, Patricia Horn. And David Mercer, good checking on both. Facebook goes okay. Yeah, choppy. I was afraid of that. And Rose Jernigan, nice to hear from all of you. Now, one of the questions I have is how on earth am I going to make this broadcast even halfway uh, entertaining when really the, the work that I have to do is... fairly monotonous. And I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how I'm going to make it entertaining <laughs> with my work. One of the work is, by its very nature is quite boring, if you will. So we'll see. I'll, I'll broadcast for a while. Many of you have nothing better to do <laughs> because you, like we, are stuck in your homes and nowhere to go. So let me be your little tiny bit of coronavirus relief. How about that? I, I take no responsibility for being good relief. <laughs> Uh, back, uh, I'll go back to the subject I mentioned. So let me tell you what I'm drawing here, by the way. This is a, a rough timber or a timber uh, porch gazebo structure that my friend is going to build um, next to a trailer, a plain old-fashioned um you know, motorhome, uh, here, here's the trailer back here. So lest you start feeling sorry for the people that have to live out in the woods in a trailer, <laughs> let me assure you, oh, by the way, I have a photograph around here somewhere, which I really would like to put my hands on right now. Here it is. All right, again, this is more my, more of my preparation. Here's the trailer. That's what it looks like right now. And they're going to build a great big attachment to it, a, a, a screened-in porch, essentially. And uh, contrary to appearances, these are not poor, poor people that you have to feel sorry for. Um, these are people of means who have decided that they would like to have their you know, second home, <laughs> so to speak, somewhere out of town. And, uh, but a little bit cramped for their whole family to live in this trailer. So my friend is going to build, my friend who's my client, who um, does um, landscape design, he's going to, he does a lot of building as well. He's quite the, what, I don't know what to call him. Besides a he-man, <laughs> he's a real, 
gorilla of a feller. <laughs> Very uh, physical, hardworking guy. In fact, I'll tell you a little about, bit about him. I, I won't tell you who he is necessarily because I don't want to embarrass him, but his name is Travis. Okay, and just to give you some idea, he's, he's a delightful character. Um, he, he literally is one of those guys that straps on a belt and a chainsaw and climbs 80-foot trees and, and brings them down. Okay, so that, that's called a, a, tree, a tree person or a bushwhacker. Yeah, Facebook, please behave. I am so sorry, folks. Um, I'm in the market for a new Mevo camera. Uh, just yesterday, I believe it was, I was told that they've come up with a new camera that I'm excited about getting. And at that time, my my um, YouTube, I mean, my uh, Facebook may start, hopefully will start behaving better. Anyway, back to my friend Travis, just because he's a, an interesting character. Um, so he drives a pickup and a cement truck and a dump truck and a, uh, you know, that kind of guy. And he pulls sheds down the highway with, you know, lights flashing. And that can, you, you get the idea? He, he throws, he throws a chainsaw around pretty much the way I throw a paintbrush around. So that, that's, you're, you're getting a, an impression. At the same time, he sings like opera. You didn't see that coming, did you? He's like an opera singer. And <laughs> I just, I'm just telling you this because I think I just love people that smash categories, don't you? So my friend Travis, who's a landscape designer and a, and a bushwhacker, and a cement mixer and a construction worker. Oh, he's also an opera singer. And oh, by the way, he's also a dancer. Like, like, like Broadway theatrical dancing. Dancer, dancer. <laughs> I just love it. And he's very, very good at all these things. He's not a, like a wannabe dancer. He's, he's like a, you know, pretty much uh, in demand kind of um, for the, for the local Broadway-ish shows that that happen in the in the RTP, which is what we call our part of the state here, Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill. <laughs> anyway, what fun! I just I just love it when people smash categories. So that's my friend. So a bit of a different kind of renaissance man <laughs> quite different from my kind of renaissance man <laughs> i don't dance a lick and i would love to sing opera I, my youngest brother by the way is a for real opera singer as is his wife but tragically it's nearly impossible to make a living as an opera singer so now my brother is one of the nation's um, foremost um, male sex therapist Counselor, expert people. <laughs> anyway, isn't life funny? My brother, sex expert. <laughs> he really is. I'm not kidding. He's doing a really good for males, for men, not for women. He's, there's lots of lots of sex therapy for women. Virtually none for men. So he found that, that need, stumbled on that need, and filled it. He's in New York, so we're praying for his, his uh, health and safety. <laughs> so there you go. Another, another man who um, breaks all the categories. <laughs> um, as, again, as I was getting ready to do this, these three illustrations, it, it dawned on me this, this would be a, a convenient moment to talk about the difference between illustration 
and um, fine art again because uh, two of these jobs, this one and the other one, the commercial jobs, would most conveniently fall in under the description of illustrations. And the question is then, if these are illustrations, then what's the difference between that and fine art? That is a question that has been asked by many people over the years, over the decades. And uh, I'm not going to try to I'm not going to try to give you the official correct answer. But one answer in from in my experience might be this: that when you are doing commercial renderings, um, your number one concern is the picture, or as I often with a smart aleck attitude, like to mispronounce his, the picture. This is a drawing of an object that's going to be built, hopefully, if the client goes for it. Does that make sense? So what is important, most important, is the picture. By the way, I am going to do something I generally tell you not to do, which is don't combine, don't mix both uh, ruler lines and, and non-ruler lines in the same illustration. But I am violating that principle. So, for in the world of illustration, the most important aspect is the picture. In the world of fine art, the most important aspect is, is uh, all the abstract elements of design. In this case, the line, the color, the texture, the values, and so forth. So the job I'm working, the illustration I'm working on right this second is, falls in the illustration category. So it's most important, if you will, that it just be a believable drawing. It's, as you can see, it's not extremely realistic. It's kind of sketchy. So that, the, the sketchy word, that connotes kind of a stylistic or a, a, a nod to fine arts, right? And that's... So it is kind of sketchy, but it essentially it is to show a client what this uh, porch addition would look like. On the other hand, in a little while I'm going to start doing this illustration rendering, and this is going to be fine arts. In fact, my client was kind enough to send me a sample of my own work from my website. And they said, we kind of like that style. And I really like that, by the way, when a, when a client sends me uh, a sample of my own work that helps solve a lot of questions. Hello, Picking Paul One. <laughs> Good to have you. I'm glad it's entertaining just watching. <laughs> Hello, to Frank. Oh, we have all kinds of new people watching. Hello, Cindy Connell. You should sing something as you as you draw. He could sing as I draw. That's a great idea. <laughs> oh, you're right. That would be a good idea, wouldn't it, to have something there to prevent the rain? Great idea. Not my job. <laughs> great idea. Not too late for that. <laughs> I do, by the way, it's, it's, I do suggest things like that. I do, you know, employ my own design creativity occasionally for, for all my clients just because, you know, I, I think, well, maybe they didn't think of this. And, and sometimes it's like, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And sometimes it's just like, no, that won't work because such and such. So 
So what David has suggested is, is not out of the question. But it is now because my clients already proved this, this rough sketch. So we don't throw curveballs at them after they've approved, right? So this is a stepping stone walkway from the front of the, uh, from the bottom of the steps over to the fire pit area. And this is, again, this is what my friend, my opera singing, dancing, tree cutting friend <laughs> is, is really good at, is, is making stuff like this look, uh, look beautiful and inviting and welcoming and so forth. And he works, he and his crew work really fast. I mean, he did some work in our backyard a couple years ago, but an area about uh, 30 feet by 12 feet, maybe. And he was out there with a chainsaw, as I remember right, flying a chainsaw around with one hand half the time. And uh, his, his, part of his crew taking wheelbarrows of gravel and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, it's truly amazing to watch watch them work. And, and that it, I remember seeing that many years ago, the first time I really watched a professional carpenter um, repair our deck on the house we lived in at the time. Um, we'd been whacked by... Uh, Hurricane Fran, 24 years ago. Wait, wait, let me make sure this is, yep, yeah, it's the right size pen. So I'm going to do a little bit of cross hatching or hatching as the case may be, before I do, um, before I start watercolor on this job. Some of you may have found me because of my one video. Life is funny, isn't it? My one video that went viral and that I published about um, seven years ago, 2013, called Pen and Ink Cross Hatching Master's Edition. And I had no idea. At the time, it was the 60th or 70th video that I had posted, perhaps. So it wasn't anything new for me to post. These were edited, not live streaming. And uh, it now has over 4 million, just past 4 million views a couple weeks ago. And uh, welcome. If, you, if this, that's how you found me, I'm glad you found me. Um, part of the irony is, of course, that at this point in my career, I, am not pri I don't primarily do pen and ink cross-hatching. But I am today, so here we are. Anyway, the technique that I teach in that video is similar to what I'm doing right now. It's a very, it's, it's my native technique, if you will. It's a very um, structured, perhaps, I would say, structured form, structured style of cross hatching. Very straight lines. All the lines go in the same direction before I start doing. Hey, Izzy, Izzy. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. I just got my light turned off on me accidentally. Um, this is this. Uh, I'm calling it strict, straight line technique. Is if you if if you look at the comments on my video, many people say, "Hey, that's not a good way." Let's you know, and they give me all kinds of other people who are fantastic artists. And, um, no, correct, this is only one way to do cross hatching. And of course, at the moment, I'm not doing any cross, I'm only doing hatching. But um, the cross, the hatching that I'm doing right now is pretty straight, right? It's not, I have seen straighter, not much. Most people are much looser than this. But I have seen a couple people in my life 
We did cross hatching even more strict, if you will, than, than this. Now here is, here's where illustration and fine arts bump into each other mash up have a have a little bit of a train wreck because just a few minutes ago I was saying that the essence of illustration is my number one concern is for the picture or the picture <laughs> as by the way hang on I need to decide which way the light is coming from here okay it's going it's going that way I can make that line so um, and yet I make a lot of decisions in, in the course of an illustration for purely abstract or, if you will, fine arts reasons. In fact, this is one. I could, comp I could finish this illustration in watercolor and achieve all the shading I need. I don't really need to do cross-hatching in order to shade this drawing. Does that make sense? I could do all the shading I need in watercolor. Why then am I taking all this time? It is quite a bit of time. Why am I taking all this time to do this hatching and or cross-hatching? And the answer is simply because I think it looks cool. In other words, purely abstract, purely abstract consideration. I just think the texture is interesting, that's all. So this, the cross-hatching technique is not the most logical uh, solution if your goal is realism or rendering or accurate drawing. Cross-hatching is not the natural solution because it's very abstract by its very nature and it's very time-consuming, it's very tedious. But there you go. So even in the realm of illustration, I am steered somewhat by purely abstract considerations. Years ago when I was doing mostly cartooning, which always makes me laugh when I think about that now. 30 years ago, I was a fairly well-known cartoonist. I half-jokingly say that if you were living in the 80s and early 90s or mid-90s in America somewhere, you saw some of my cartoons. I used to tell my kids, I'm really famous, just nobody knows it. <laughs> Now, I didn't do like uh, cartoon strips. No, I was a commercial, purely commercial cartoonist. So my stuff would show up on, you know, an ad for Coca-Cola or a computer or a <laughs> packaging tape, or who knows what, you know, crazy stuff. Um, and uh, Frisbees, I, there was one point. 25 years ago, if you walked into a sporting goods store and bought a, a, fris, a disc, disc golf disc, which most of the rest of the world used to call Frisbees, um, the chances are good the disc you bought had my artwork on it. Funny stuff like that has absolutely nothing to do with, it just happens to be, you know, which ad agency gets the job from the, in this case, the disc Frisbee company, which which uh, which ad agency gets the job, and then the ad agency farms out the illustration, and they just happen to call me no good reason. There was a series, there was a series of malls, shopping malls, up in New Jersey, and and the New York area, again in the mid to late nineties, that for their marketing campaign featured a number of my cartoons. I mean, they're all, all of this is, of course, lost. <laughs> lost to posterity now. 
but the reason I brought that up was that I often chuckled to myself even back in the day when I was doing cartoons at how many decisions I made as a cartoonist. I made decisions based on quote unquote fine art considerations, purely abstract um, considerations like this one, like the fact that I'm doing cross-hatching merely for, oh boy, my wife is bringing me lunch. Yahoo, four o'clock, not a moment too soon. Thanks, Reedy. So, if you want to see any of my cartoons, you can go to dannelsonart.com and uh, click on the illustration page. And then in the illustration page, there is um, an album of cartoons. And why would you not want to go see my cartoons? That's what I'd like to know. <laughs> What, what I'm doing right now is actually not that far removed from cartooning, is it? Pen and ink, line work, cross hatching. Most of my cartooning employed cross hatching, actually. I started developing my cross-hatching technique in fifth grade, so I was 10 years old, 1965, should be 55 years ago. I clearly remember starting to draw people with large bulbous noses, which for the most part has stayed with me all these decades. Most of my cartoons feature large bulbous noses. And at the same time, I began doing some kind of cross-hatching. I don't clearly remember. And I think, as I said before, I think I was influenced by Mad Magazine. Now, my mom would not have approved of Mad Magazine. So believe me, I did not subscribe to Mad Magazine. This was contraband stuff that I saw. in the hands of my friends. anybody here in a hurry? <laughs> it doesn't do me any good to be in a hurry, I tell you, when I'm doing cross-hatching. That is just not a, not a winning proposition. This is more, more better to, <laughs> to be in a zen-ish meditative state than, than any kind of hurry and rush. Just doesn't do, you can't do cross-hatching in a hurry. It's a lot like, by the way, I don't know how many of you have played around with calligraphy. I would say that that's what I am. I am a player arounder with calligraphy. Um, it's way on the outer fringes of my art career. If I had time for another hobby in my life, though, it, it might be calligraphy. And uh, one of the things I like so much about it, if you haven't tried it, perhaps you should give it a, a, give it a whirl, give it a try. Um, 
one of the things I like so much about calligraphy is that you absolutely have to be in a relaxed state to do it well. So it's a little bit like forced a forced meditative state, a forced Zen, if you will, if you want to use that as a synonym for meditative state. So it really is quite pleasant. If you do calligraphy for, for 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half, when you get up, hopefully, you'll be in a very good frame of mind because you have to be relaxed when you're doing it. And cross-hatching is a little bit like that, not, not quite to the same degree. But there are some similarities. There, starting to look like a, whatever, porch, isn't it? Now I'm going to make the shadow come out in this direction. Hello, DeFrank Images. Well, that's a great name. I need to look you up. And Judy's Quilts and Watercolor. I need to look you up, too. Well, hello from Vietnam. Hi from Brazil. Welcome. I take it we're all stuck indoors, aren't we? All over the world. Isn't this the most bizarre season? It is just, it just almost belies belief, doesn't it? Just fascinating. Now, again, this will get a whole lot more than fascinating. If you or me or someone we know gets sick, then it'll, especially if they're my age. Um, but for, I'm going to try not to waste time worrying about that. So far, I've succeeded quite well and not worrying. Um, but um, honestly, these last three weeks have been delightfully peaceful. <laughs> um, if you watched any of my broadcasts about doing the, doing the portraits, um, what a great way to hang out. Whoops, almost got off camera there, didn't I? Sorry about that. Let's do a little bit of dirt texture. You know, one of the things that that have that happens, I don't usually say it this way, but the more art you do, you develop little tricks, almost tricks of the hand almost, for rendering various things. What you see me doing right here is, is one of my tricks for giving the, the idea, the sense of a rough texture. Um, and it's a combination of little tiny circles, well, ovals, horizontal, because I want it to look like it's, they're laying on the ground, um, interspersed with little dots. So it's dots and ovals, dots and ovals, dots and ovals. And that's just a little shorthand trick that I've used literally for decades. It serves me well, I think. 
in fact, and the same thing is true, of course, even, even perhaps even more so. I don't know. It's very true for painting as well. That good artists have developed good, I'll call them shorthand tricks. What I mean by that is you, they utilize the same little trick over and over and over again to to render this or that or this or that object. Like for instance trees and I've I've shown you over the last several weeks several times. I, I'll, I'll do it again. I, I did it up here but I didn't talk about it. Um, little a little just little tricks and we have a name for people whose little tricks work very well. <laughs> we call them good artists. <laughs> um, for instance, I think of one of the younger American artists whose work many people admire, and I'm among them, is Jeremy Mann. Jeremy M-A-N-N -N, out in uh, out in the uh, San Francisco area of California. He does basically two things primarily. Uh, figurative, beautiful women kind of stuff. We've talked about that before by the way. That's another subject. And he does cityscapes. And I, because I do a lot of cityscapes, of course, I particularly tune in to the the way he does cityscapes. And his work is a, is a good example of this principle of which I speak, that we all develop little tricks that we come back to over and over and over again. And those artists whose tricks communicate in a satisfactory manner to the widest audience, we consider them to be good artists. Now, I should add just real quickly again just in case anybody's watching me for the first time. When I talk about artists I'm virtually exclusively and only talking about what I call visual artists. And I, I mean, boy, I'm not, I'm, I, don't, I'm not, I don't mean in counter distinction to musicians and dancers and composers and poets. No, no, no. I know. No, no, no. I'm just talking about visual people that do visual art. But in the realm of visual art, quote unquote, there's a, the, a wide swath of 20th century modern and contemporary artists who the, the purpose of their painting or drawing or sculpture is to communicate. And I don't call those people artists because frankly, they say my art is communication. So I call them, I take them at their word and I say these people are communicators. Okay, now that, that opens a whole can of worms that I don't have the energy to jump into right now, so I won't. But anyway, I'm only, when I talk about artists, I'm talking about people who are concerned essentially with beauty. Now, beauty, of course, is a dangerous and a loaded philosophical term. Again, I don't have the energy at the moment to get into it. I will some other day, no doubt. But, um, so when I'm talking about people have little tricks for rendering this or that, I'm really only talking about people who are doing essentially representational painting or excellent abstract painting. By, vi by the visual artists, I mean people whose artwork is not primarily about an idea, it's primarily about a visual idea. Light, value, texture, line, shape, color, and so forth. Those are visual artists. All the people who are busy uh, promulgating a point of view are in fact promulgators, <laughs> propagandists or preachers. That's why I don't call them um, or consider them um, artists per se, because they have defined, they themselves say, 
the most important aspect of my work, they might say, is the message. They're more than welcome to have that viewpoint, but in my book, they are, once they become message artists, they're no longer visual artists, they are message artists. They're preaching, propagandizing, or selling something. And that is what most uh, contemporary artists are primarily concerned with, is preaching a message through their art. You, you, now you're beginning to see what I'm talking about. You know it's true. All right. A little bit more dots and ovals. I think that that illustration is, is done. At least done enough. Tell you what, let's do this. Let's instead of instead of uh, me moving on to um, one of the other illustrations, instead, let me move on to to watercolor on this particular particular illustration. Okay, so I'm gonna lift you guys up. And hope you'll stay there. This is one of my watercolor trays, one of many. I have many kits of everything, by the way. In fact, just the other night, I put together another kit. And that's simply because of the way my personality, my idiosyncrasies, work. Um, I'm a fairly organized person, fairly organized. I'm a more of a neat neck than a messy, which is a little bit unusual for an artist. More, most artists tend to be more free spirited and messy. Um, I have, there are parts of my life that are messy. The top of my dresser <laughs> in my bed, uh, in my bedroom and my van are messy. But frankly, I'm a, almost a little bit proud of the parts of my life that are messy. Here's, here's why. Oh, you know what? I never did official. Let's get official. Daily Art Adventure 876. Woohoo! A little bit late for that, but <laughs> there we go. Um, I'm, why, why would somebody be proud of being messy? Well, it's because of where I've come from. That's why. So that, you, you couldn't imagine what I'm talking about until I tell you what I'm talking about, which is this. When I was a teenager, and some of you will have a hard time. You don't know anybody like this, but some of you do. When I was a teenager, I was, I would say now, neurotically neat. I was, I was crazy neat. And it was crazy. So, and, and when I was a teenager, I, I would say I border, I was borderline OCD. Um, now, I, I don't think I wasn't real because I was quite happy. So I, I, I didn't make myself miserable. It never got to the point of being a real problem. But it was way more, you know, too extreme on the neat end of the spectrum instead of the messy. So for me to be content at this stage of life, allow, allowing parts of my life to be quite messy is actually a sign of uh, health. <laughs> Now, you messies, you can't even imagine that, for probably. And I think generally speaking, I don't know, but I think generally there are more messies than there are needies in the general population. doesn't matter whether I'm right or not. I'm, I'm not making a point other than just, I think, just sheer numbers. I think there's more people who tend to be messy than needy. Anyway, boy, that was a long detour I didn't need to take, wasn't it? Anyway, so because of the way my, uh, my particular personality, being a needy, I make up several kits. So like the one that I made up the other day, and what got me onto this is this, this is one of my watercolor trays. And I can, right now I can think of four, five water, separate watercolor trays. And someone could rightly say, that's ridiculous. Why does anybody need five separate watercolor trays? And my answer is because they all have different size and function. Um, for instance, the, one of them is a kit that I just put together uh, Sunday night, and it's my new uh, anatomy 
drawing kit. I'm, I'm saying some of this stuff because somebody out there might be, especially a young person who might be watching, somebody out there might be benefited from hearing this. Um, so I have a, a large sketchbook, about 9 by 12 inch sketchbook, just ordinary drawing paper in it, that was just uh, inaugurated, if I can use that term, as, as my uh, anatomy workbook. Uh, and that happened about uh, how many weeks ago? No, six, eight months ago. Okay. Uh, no, six months ago. All right. So I have a large, now let me, that requires a little bit more explanation. Why do I have a new anatomy book? And I'm very happy to tell you the answer to that. The answer is because I'm scheduled to teach a, uh, an anatomy class, it's 13, 12 weeks of anatomy uh, starting in August. August through December, November this fall and I'm very excited about it. So I'm teaching, it's a anatomy by rote. It, it's focusing up particularly on ways to remember. I don't know how many of you have ever tackled, um, hello Roger Atencio, you're very welcome. Good to have you on board. Um, if any of you have ever undertaken the study of human anatomy for the purpose of art, for being a good artist, the, the first uh, roadblock you encounter is there's just way too much information in the human body. I mean, you have to, yes, you find all of a sudden, just like you're a medical student, you're trying to remember all these bones and all these muscles and all these bulges and shapes and doohickeys. You follow me? Um, so the focus of my class, I'm calling it anatomy to remember, because I'm, I'm going to focus on what I think is one of my strong suits, which is inventing or creating mnemonic devices. That is tricks for remembering stuff. And I'm having, I'm having an absolute ball preparing for it. So anyway, so I have this sketchbook about this big that I'm doing my preparatory anatomy sketches in. And when I sit down, this, this is just my personality, when I sit down to do my anatomy work in this notebook, I don't want to have to go running around the house, running around my studio. By the way, I have more than one studio, so it gets even more complicated than that. I'm a very blessed man. I have two, two studios in my home, upstairs and down. I'm currently, most of the day, time these days, in my up, I am in my upstairs studio because I have four grandchildren in the house and they're usually making some kind of noise. So anyway, so when, when I decide, okay, hot dog, I have 45 minutes to work on my anatomy class. And by working, I mean, I'm doing, I'm drawing, drawing anatomy and making up mnemonic devices and so forth. Anyway. I grab my sketchbook and I don't want to have to run around, open drawers, uh, look on shelves. I don't want to have to search. I don't have, don't have to, do you follow me? I don't want to run out to the car to look for this and that and this and that tool and device. Therefore, I put together a kit and it's like permanently affixed. Part of it is anyway, to the cover. So that's, that's one of my watercolor kits. Anyway, um, but the, the principle is make separate kits. Let me give you a better example even.